Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Sowers, your guest host today for uh, Encompass Live, the weekly online event from the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Krista is on vacation this week, and this is also the Tech Talk episode, so I'm running the show on my own today. So if we have any technical issues, because I don't do this very often, uh, please bear with me on that. Um, Encompass Live is our weekly show in which we feature uh, topics of interest to Nebraska librarians and the librarians from all over the world. We have uh, uh, guest speakers, we have commission staff that present, and once a month, usually the last Wednesday of the month, we do Tech Talk with me, the Michael Sowers, the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Library Commission. And today we have uh, Cynthia Stodgdill, a, a returning guest. Cynthia was on back in May with uh, covering Google Apps for Education, and she is the school librarian at the Belfield Millican Park Elementary uh, School in Fremont, Nebraska. And we noticed uh, during her last session that she did a lot with Twitter. We asked a couple questions about that at the end, and she made the uh, wonderful for us mistake of saying, sure, I'll come back on and I'll talk about how we use Twitter. And so I was able to grab her uh, once again before the school year started up. So, uh, Cynthia, good morning, and how are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me back. I'm excited. All right. So, uh, you, we've got your presentation up there on the screen. Uh, what are you doing with Twitter? Well, um, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, I could talk for days on Twitter and how we can use it. Um, to promote our libraries and in education, so I'm just excited to share this um, with all of you. And let's see, um, once again, I'm Cynthia Stogdell. Um, I am a school librarian at Fremont Public Schools, and I was um, in two elementaries last year, and this year I'm moving to um, Johnson Crossing and the middle school, so I'm moving up from K-4 to 5, 6, and 7, 8, so that'll be a change for me, and I'm really excited. Um, to start that new adventure. And so um, just a little bit about myself. Um, Michael actually found me through my blog, The Tangled Librarian, and that's just kind of a um, log or diary of kind of my journey as, as a library professional, and there's a lot of stuff in there, things I don't want to forget, things I want to celebrate. Um, it's kind of a nice thing to go back to and kind of remember um, where I've been and how much I've grown and that um, hopefully other librarians will see that when they're starting out and, and maybe not find themselves quite so alone. So the presentation that I'm um, showing you today will be on there as well as on the Encompass website. So it'll be in a couple places for you to check out any additional resources. So when I talk about Twitter, I've kind of tweaked this over the years that I've talked about Twitter in schools and libraries. And the one thing I kind of want to start with this time is to talk about um, Twitter and how you use it personally. And you really kind of have to know who you want to be with Twitter or with social media. And I'll say up front, um, I'm not a huge Facebook fan, but if Facebook is what works for you, you can definitely transition any of this to um, Facebook. Twitter is just what worked for me. Um, that's where I'm comfortable and that seems to work for me professionally so but it will certainly transfer to some other medium if that's what works for you but when you are talking about Twitter you really want to know who you are as a presence and what your goal is in terms of using Twitter professionally and in your library and in education and so Something I came across about a couple years ago um, was a Twitterosophy, and it's just kind of a little statement. It's kind of like your own personal mission statement, but what exactly do you want to accomplish with your social media resource? Who do you want to be? Um, where do you want, what do you want yourself to look like? Because it's um, very easy to get your personal and your professional lives mixed up in social media. And I try to be very mindful of the fact that um, I want to be able to show my students my Twitter account or my Twitter feed at any time and use that kind of as a model for digital citizenship. So um, I am very kind of just always keep that in mind. At one point I had two accounts. I did have a library account and a personal account and that's certainly something that you can do. When I moved from K-12 to K-4, 
Um, I did not add a library account when I went to Fremont because those kids probably weren't on Twitter. As I'm moving um, back into middle school, that's something I'm, I'm thinking about, but I haven't made a decision yet. But you really want to think about who are you and who do you want to be and what does that uh, footprint look like because um, you're going to be a model to your students and to your community. So when you are talking about branding, branding is really just um, creating a presence with your school or your library, and this certainly applies to public libraries as well as schools. Um, but the thing you want to remember is the best way to predict your future is to create it. If you tell your story, people will hear it. If you don't tell your story, trust me, someone else will. And we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. But um, I love this quote by Abraham Lincoln. I'm a huge Abraham Lincoln fan. Also Thomas Jefferson is my, another one of my, my favorites. But I love this quote because it really does um, kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of what we can do with Twitter. So what not to do. Um, this is an article that um, came out last November and I was driving home from school listening to public radio and this um, news clip came on about J.P. Morgan and J.P. Morgan wanted to um, jump into the social media uh, ring and talk to some college students about their company and you know what they were what their image was and they they kind of wanted to promote themselves to some you know young up-and-coming professionals and so they created a hashtag and they decided we're gonna go do a chat and we're gonna have you know people talk about how great we are and um, it really backfired and the reason that it backfired on them was because they jumped into social media with no investment prior to their chat they just thought, we'll create a chat, we'll start talking, everybody loves us, and nobody will say anything bad. And as you can see on the screen, um, one of the comments that was uh, tweeted during that chat was, how many J.P. Morgan bankers does it take to screw in a light bulb? None, they just foreclose on the house. And that's kind of the way the entire chat went. And it um, didn't take very long for them to say, well, I think we're done with the chat for today. They kind of backtracked and ran off with their tail between their legs and it was really kind of turned into a social media nightmare for them because they thought by just jumping into Twitter everybody would know who they were, everyone would know what they stood for, but they hadn't put any, any investment into the game. They just made a lot of assumptions. And so one of the things that you want to do when you are thinking about using Twitter for branding your district or branding your library is you really want to start when nobody knows anything about you. You want to be the first one talking about your school, your library, what you're doing, your students, um, that kind of thing. Because if you don't start that conversation, if you don't create that account and start talking about yourself, someone else will, and then it can turn very negative. So this is my favorite example. I love this. It's such a great example of of someone in a huge corporation not understanding that they really should have started kind of promoting themselves in a positive way prior to going out and asking people for input. Um, so when you're talking about branding with Twitter, um, there's some main components. Um, you really want to use it to grow. You want to really be prepared to collaborate with your stakeholders. You want to be able to share what you're doing, you need to celebrate your victories, you need to celebrate your students, celebrate your staff. You want to be able to give, you want to give information, you want to give um, secret tweets where people can maybe come in and get something that nobody else can, and you really want to support each other. If you are in a district where you might have several schools with a Twitter account, um, you want to retweet each other and you want to support each other and um, share all that information because you might be reaching some stakeholders that maybe another group of people in your district may not be. And um, so it's just a courtesy to support the group as a whole. And 
Honestly, most of the stuff that I get or that I've learned about social media is um, from this amazing book, The Librarian's Nitty Gritty Guide to Social Media. Love, love this book. Um, go buy it. <laughs> it's really awesome. And it really talks about um, specifically libraries and social media and kind of just a step-by-step, -step, here's how you start, here's some do's, here's some don'ts, here's where it can take you, here's some plans, and just kind of the whole process in a nutshell. So that is such a great, great resource, and if you can get your hands on a copy, um, I have it, it's marked up, highlighted, sticky noted, and I use it for um, just a great reference for using social media in the library. So social media and Twitter in the libraries and in schools is kind of a two-pronged approach. Um, the first thing you can do is really take control of your professional development and um, you can also share your story. And at Fremont, um, I have been fortunate enough to be able to um, have two hashtags that we kind of developed and I worked with um, another administrator, um, one who's going to be my, my principal this coming year, and I said we really need to um, create a hashtag for our district. Um, there are some great districts um, in Nebraska that use hashtags and I think there's a lawnmower going outside. Yeah, there is. So if you hear that buzzing noise, that's somebody's lawnmower going by. Um, so we worked together to create a hashtag um, because we really wanted to start telling our story and start with that hashtag before um, people really knew who we were. And if you are on Twitter, you know that York Dukes has um, their hashtag, EM Wolves is Exeter Milligan, MPS Panthers, they do um, some great stuff and they tweet out great things about what's going on at Norfolk. So we kind of wanted to start that even before a lot of people were on Twitter at Fremont Public Schools or were maybe using it in hopes that we would establish kind of that brand and that hashtag and then it would, it would take off um, from there. The FPSTTWT, that is kind of an internal hashtag and I'm going to talk about hashtags in a little bit, but um, the FPSTTWT is a group of teachers that I get to work with. Um, through our curriculum department and our curriculum director, Darren Kelberlau, kind of put a group of people together who um, kind of work with technology and we're kind of talking about technology and sharing a lot of technology with um, the other teachers and our students. And so we kind of kind of hang together. And so if I'm using that hashtag, that's kind of a maybe a tech tool that I want to share with them. And the FPS Connect is more of a, a tag for sharing what our kids are doing and celebrating some of those victories. So the internal influence um, can start with professional development and that's kind of a big thing right now. Um, professional development can be very expensive. It takes time and you have to kind of balance the professional development time with teacher work time and honestly Twitter is such a great professional development tool. It's free, it's 24 hours a day you can do it whenever, wherever, so if it's possible to harness the power of Twitter and some of the resources that you can find on Twitter and kind of incorporate that into your professional development, it's just such a great way to enhance um, the PD in your district and it's a great way for teachers to really find specific things that apply to them. It's not kind of a, a broad well, this is, this is an educational theory that's, you know, popular right now. You can take your third grade teachers and they can find third grade teachers on Twitter and they can talk about what they're doing and they can do that all over the world. They can um, share lessons, they can share resources, they can, you know, give each other advice and support each other. There is probably um, a group of people, group of educators for every single person in a district. Uh, my very first year as a teacher, I was um, involved with a group, um, the new teacher chat, and that was, I think, hashtag NT chat, and they did a chat um, about once a month, and it was just first year teachers talking about, you know, what was happening and what was going on in their classrooms and some of their struggles, and it was, you know, K-12 teachers 
um, lots of different content areas, but everybody kind of had the same struggles and kind of the same um, things that they, you know, wanted to talk about. And even I learned a ton. I mean, I always came away from that chat with a little bit of um, just a little piece of information that I could take with me and use um, that as well. Um, another great professional development tool is Zite, which is a digital news um, paper. And what's really cool about this is that you can you can find articles that are very specific to you. You sign up for your account and you kind of choose the categories that you are interested in or things that you want to learn more about. And then as you give each article a thumbs up or a thumbs down, it kind of uses an algorithm to tailor what you get sent to you um, based on what you like and what you don't like. So stuff you're not really interested in, you may not see again. Things that you do like, you'll get more of that. And you might come across articles and think, you know what, okay, I know the teacher across the hall would just love this. And you can just quick email that link to that teacher and just share those ideas um, across your learning network. And that can be within your building, it can be within your district, it can be within your state, it can even be across the world. So this is kind of um, just a, a graphic of Zite and what it looks like. And what happens is um, you just choose your article and the article on this is how to create videos in Google Drive. I pulled that article up and if you notice the arrow with the up, thumbs up, thumbs down, if you like that article, you just tap that thumbs up and it will kind of automatically calculate, okay, you like these articles, we'll find more of these. If it's a thumbs down, they'll say, okay, we're going to throw out those components and you may not see that again. And that's a really handy, um, just kind of a cool way to get good stuff that is applicable to you. And then <clears throat> you can share it. And just by hitting that um, box with the arrow button, you can either email that link to another teacher or you can tweet it out. And if you notice here, I went ahead and I said um, hashtag FPS TTWT, which is my, my group of people that um, I talked to at Fremont. And then the other hashtag is Nebraska Ed Chat. And I'm just going to do a shameless plug for that. Um, Nebraska Ed Chat is um, a group of educators that started in Nebraska and um, I was very honored to be included with um, Brandon and Shelley Moinkle and Laura Kroll and my husband Chris um, put that together and we do a weekly chat on Wednesday nights and it's based on education but we cover all kinds of things. We talk about books that inspire us, we talk about um, apps that everybody's using, we talk about um, education trends, we talk about, sometimes we talk about assessments, um, all kinds of stuff, but I have made such great connections using um, Twitter and Nebraska Ed Chat has been a really huge part of that and it's just a, it's a great um, resource because you can always find something you can use. And we do archive that chat on um, a wiki space and it's nebraskaedchat.wikispaces.com and we archive the chat weekly, so if you can't participate in the chat or you are not able to catch it, you can go back <clears throat> and we do a PDF of all of the posts and all of those um, tweets that people put out, and you can go back and take a look at that. And we have probably as many people checking out the archive as we do maybe participating sometimes. So that's <clears throat> another great, um, part of Twitter is this learning network of people that you develop and they're not necessarily people that you see every day, they might be people you only see at NIDA or maybe at a conference that you go to once a year, but you really um, are able to share and um, exchange ideas. So there's my Nebraska Ed Chat shameless plug and when we are starting up on August 27th, so kind of if you're on Twitter, watch that. and. Um, just watch, and if you feel like jumping in, um, please do. We love to have new people all the time. So that is Zite, and that's how you can share articles out to Twitter. And you will be surprised. You will share something out, and people will retweet it. They'll pass it on to their um, people in their learning network and maybe ask you a question, or you can just make a really great connection. The other Part of the professional development that I use is I have created um, a digital newspaper of my own 
based on um, the hashtags that I use, FPS, TTWT, and um, FPS Connect. And so my paper is set up to pull all of the tweets with that hashtag once a week, and it dumps it into a really nice little digital newspaper, and it shoots me an email. And then <clears throat> what I do with that is I send that out to a group of people at Fremont Public Schools, and it's just there. <clears throat> they might not be on Twitter. It, that might not be something that works for them. But I want to share those resources with them in another way as well. So I shoot that out to them through an email, and they can read it, and they can delete it. It's up to them, but it's in their inbox, and it's there. And it's also kind of a nice way for me to kind of archive some things that um, I've tweeted that I might want to come back to. So um, I use Paperly, but Scoop It is another one that people use to create digital newspapers. And so that's another byproduct of Twitter. And that's kind of a cool resource as well. So we have professional development, and then we have um, student resources. And Twitter can be a really powerful resource for your students, um, maybe more towards secondary level. When I was in um, K-12, I was based mainly in our 712 library, so I did have a separate library account. And when I left um, <clears throat> Lakeview, I handed that account over to the wonderful librarian that took my place so that she could keep it going, and she was really um, gracious about wanting to do that because we already had kids following us. We had um, things we were doing. We did secret tweets, which was really awesome. I would send out a Tuesday tweet, and if you came in and said, you know, this is what the secret tweet is, you got a prize. Um, it might be a piece of candy. It might be a pencil. It might be something. But it was just, you know, something techy, some little tip, maybe a digital citizenship thing. But um, we had kind of a little following with that. And then um, we did a digital book club. We um, were reading some books, and kids were tweeting about what they were reading and just kind of sharing ideas. And that was so fun to watch that because we started that and not really sure where it was going to go, and the kids kind of took it and ran with it. And so that's just was kind of a cool thing. And then the sustained reading. I mean, even when the digital book club kind of ended, people were still sharing books with each other, and that to me was a, just a, a sign of a huge success that we were able to um, get kids reading and keep them reading. So it isn't always about technology. It's also another way to um, enhance getting kids to read. Um, another thing that I loved about using Twitter with my kids, um, they knew I was on Twitter, and if they got stuck at night doing some of their work, they could tweet me, and I could help them. And I'm, um, as I said, kind of when we talked about Google Apps for Education in May, I'm, I'm kind of a 24-7 kind of person. If my kids are stuck and it's 7 o'clock at night, they know they can email me. They um, knew that they could tweet me. And this young lady, she tweeted, um, she tweeted someone else actually first and said, does anybody know the password? And another student said, duh, tweet Lakeview Librarian, she'll give it to you. So she tweeted me through our library account, and um, I direct messaged her the password because we do keep those passwords private. And then she got it, and she was able to continue working on her paper, and I think this was during um, part of their research project. But that was at 6 o'clock at night. But she was able to get what she needed, and she could move on, and she didn't get stuck. And to me, I mean, anything to keep kids moving, keep them learning, keep them researching, and keep that ball rolling, um, I'm all for that. So I was just so excited that she thought, well, let's do this. I'll, we'll tweet you, and we'll get what we need. And that was really fun. And I'm, I'm just, that's something I'm really honestly very proud of, that my kids kind of took that resource and it to something that um, was useful to them. So then we move to um, our external influences if you're going to use um, Twitter kind of as, as a way to tell your story. Um, I know we've had tons of things happening in our state. We've had tornadoes, we've had hailstorms, and something my husband said um, not very long ago 
that in a lot of communities, um, especially smaller communities, the school is really the heart of what um, goes on in that community. And people look to the school sometimes for guidance and they look to them for some resources. And so Twitter is such a great way to get information out to people. And one thing about it is that it comes to their phone. They don't have to go check a website. They don't have to call anybody. They can just pull up their phone. They can look at it and they can say, oh, this is what we're doing. Or, oh, we just, they closed school at 2.30 because of snow or, you know, I know that there were probably tweets all over the place when the tornado went through Pilger. I mean, those that, that community just pulled together and people came from all over. And social media was part of um, the power of getting people together. So it is a great way to share information, to get information out to people. And you might still use a paper newsletter, you might still use a website, but adding that social media component just gets your message out to more people and it comes right to them. So um, I was just, he said that one day and I just thought, you know, you're so right and Twitter can be such a great way to um, enhance um, having the school be the center of a community. It's also something that um, you can use to model digital citizenship. Instead of saying we're not going to talk about social media, um, let's use it and let's show kids how to do it and let's advocate for our school, let's show our stakeholders what we're doing, let's create that transparency and show that our, our staff and our teachers are constantly learning, constantly being inspired and constantly wanting to learn more so that when we go to the community and say, hey, we need computers, we need a bond issue, we need some help, we need some, um, some volunteers, they already know through Twitter that you are doing great stuff for kids every single day. You're showing what you're doing. You're showing who's, um, you know, sports scores, awards, um, state um, championships, anything like that. You're talking about your kids. You're showing people what you're doing. And people who are following you on Twitter will know um, these people are working hard for our kids, and yeah, we are willing to um, put some money into those resources because we know that it's going to the kids. So that's another, it's just a huge tool. And the digital citizenship piece is really important. Like I said earlier, I'm um, always mindful of what um, I'm tweeting because I want to be able to put my Twitter feed up in front of my kids anytime. So I'm very, you know, careful about the pictures that are on there, what I say, and I'm very honest with them. I tell them, you know, I've been just smoking hot mad at somebody and wanted to just fire off a tweet and know that they'll see it and they'll know it's them and, you know, maybe not name a name. And I really want to do that. And I just have to think this is not a good choice. This is not a good digital citizenship choice. This is not part of my footprint that I want to be permanent. And we talk about that. And they're always kind of amazed that, you know, oh, well, Mrs. S gets mad and she wants to, you know, say something snarky to somebody. And they know that they've been in that situation and that you had to make a choice. So it's, it's a great, great tool. If you can put that up in front of kids, it's not an imaginary person. It's not, um, you know, just an example of somebody that they don't know. It's you standing in front of them saying, this is who I am. And that's pretty powerful to kids. So basically the gist of using Twitter is if you tell your story, um, you can get your name out there. You can say what you're doing and do it before someone else does because we all know there's a ton of negativity about education, um, especially in the media and on social media. But if you're out there saying, this is what we're doing in our school, this is what we're doing in our library, these are the things that we have available. When somebody comes through with a tweet that says, you know, something maybe negative, there will be more people who will say, well, you know, I don't think we're going to believe that because we really know who these people are. We know what this district stands for. We know that they're all about kids or if it's a public library, we know they're all about our community. 
and they're going to maybe brush off that negative comment where if you're not out there and you're not telling your story and you're not a presence, um, they can say what they want and you're, you don't have a lot of recourse. And this is one of the ways that I've told um, Mar, our story at Fremont. Um, we did an author Skype with um, a fabulous author, Kimberly Griffith Little, and she, um, we did a, um, I think we had three or four classes cycle through because we just started talking and we just kept talking and talking and talking. And she um, has written books that we had in our library, so they were able to, in real time, talk to her. It wasn't a video. It was an actual conversation, and the kids got to ask questions. And we did that with um, two different authors this past school year. And it was so exciting to see them um, ask these questions. And they were such great questions. Like, you know, what book do you, which book have you written that you like the least? Just, you know, and I was so proud of them, and I was so amazed at how they just really um, connected with, um, with her and then just devoured her books. And so that's just a great way to get kids um, talking about books and reading books. And a lot of authors will Skype for free. It, it costs a lot to have an author come to your school, but a lot of authors will talk to you for maybe a half hour at no charge. So that's definitely something that you might want to look into. Um, the other thing that I love to do is I love to take pictures of what my kids are doing. Um, the one with the comic, we were working on, um, we were learning about comics, and so we kind of incorporated some of our Dewey Decimal knowledge into those comics. And for some reason, everybody picked the alien to be Dewey Decimal. I don't know why that was, but um, that was kind of the trend. And I just loved some of the stuff they came up with, so I tweeted quite a few of their comics for people to see. But that kind of showed um, people in the community or people that were following um, maybe our FPS Connect hashtag that um, we're doing some cool stuff and our kids are having fun and they're making some great connections. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about hashtags. And a hashtag is basically a topic. Um, it's kind of like switching channels on a television and that my very good friend Otis Pierce from um, ESU7 came up with that analogy. It's basically a topic and you can create any topic you want. Um, you can see there's gratitude, there's Nebraska EdChat, there's um, EdChat, FPS Connect, Viking Tech was one that we used at Lakeview. Um, so you can create a tweet, you can send a message and then you put that hashtag on there and it kind of just qualifies the tweet with that topic. It says, this is kind of what this tweet is about. And if people search, for example, Nebraska Ed Chat, they will see all the tweets that people have um, sent out using that hashtag, and they can kind of see what that conversation looks like. So a hashtag is, is pretty important. And you can see this is kind of a screenshot of um, my tweet deck feed and I have a column with FPS TTWT so I can kind of see, um, keep track of stuff that we're talking about within that group of people and then our district FPS connect and we can um, just kind of share some of that stuff and I like to kind of keep track because now other people in our district are using FPS connect so if I see something from another person I can retweet that and share that with my network as well. So one thing about hashtags, though, um, before you even think about using Twitter with your school or your public library, you definitely want to check with the bosses and make sure that they're okay with you using Twitter as a tool. When I came to Fremont, um, I checked with our curriculum director, and he um, asked a few other people, and they kind of came back and gave me some parameters and said, you know, no faces, no names, which um, with kids, I definitely do that. I don't show faces. I don't show names. There's times when I really, truly want to because the look on their faces is so priceless and I'm so proud of them. But ultimately, we want to protect them and protect their privacy. So I usually end up showing the back of their head and not naming names. But eventually, you know, if they're looking or we show that Twitter feed up on the screen, they'll know it. You know, the kids know who they are. But um, out in 
the actual globally speaking on Twitter, um, they're not identifiable. So that's something that you definitely want to be mindful of. Um, does your district have a social media policy? Um, if they do, you need to know what it is and make sure you're abiding by that. And then who owns the account? Um, are you going to manage that? Is it your personal account? Are you going to have a district account? Those are some things that you definitely need to take into consideration um, when you are using Twitter for your district. And if you create a hashtag for your district, the best way to do that is to decide what you want to use and search it over several days. And that's kind of what we did with our FPS Connect hashtag. But this spring, um, after Nita, we were kind of talking about um, just gratitude and being joyful and thinking about what's a great hashtag we can use to kind of celebrate some cool stuff that we want to, you know, just be grateful for. And um, Joy ED was brought up, and so we thought, well, okay, well, I'll, I thought, I'll use that. I'll start using that. And I didn't search it. I didn't really research it. And um, after about a week or so, I did a search just to kind of see if anybody else was using it and found out that um, Joy ED was not necessarily educational. So then I had to go back and change my hashtag to Joy EDU. So don't make that mistake. Um, definitely search that hashtag and then um, make sure that it doesn't mean something other than what you were intending. And then once you create that hashtag, use it or lose it. Because if you're not using it, trust me, someone else will grab it and you'll have to start all over again. Um, and I always get questions when I talk about Twitter, just basic things about Twitter. And since I can't see any of you or talk to any of you, um, Cyberry Man is a fabulous gentleman. He's on Twitter. He's on the web. But he put together this really nice Twitter 101 um, web page as part of his website. And it's just a super, super great um, resource for getting started with Twitter. Um, how to do a chat, what are some of the chats that are out there, who are some great people to follow. So um, this is a link to this page, and that will be on the Encompass site as well as on my blog, and you can check that out. But he's a great place um, to start and get some great information. And if you still have trouble, you are always welcome to email me or to tweet me, and I will um, definitely help you get started. So kind of in closing, basically you just want to let everything, let everyone know um, the great things you're doing for kids every day. So that people know who you are, they know what you're doing, you've got that information out there so that when you need something from your stakeholders, they know that money is going to go to kids, those resources are going to go to kids, you're doing things for kids, you're doing things for the community and they won't think twice about helping you. If you don't kind of put that um, deposit into that bank account, you don't have any support to withdraw from um, when you need some help. And any questions that you have for me? Cynthia, that was great, wonderful. Um, and I forgot to mention to everyone that uh, yeah, we will happily take your questions. Uh, there is a questions uh, area in the GoToWebinar interface. You can type them in there. Or if you have a microphone, we are more than happy to um, turn on your microphone and hear your dulcet tones. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll, uh, instead of typing, so if you have questions, just go ahead and do that. Just uh, type into the questions, uh, unmute me, and I will happily uh, uh, turn on your microphone for you. Uh, we've already gotten a couple of questions that have come in, and I've got a couple of myself. And first, I'm going to say, I I literally laughed out loud when you mentioned the question for the author about which book do you of yours do you like the least. Um, I, I have <laughs> I have literally attended hundreds of author talks and Q and As over the years, and I I have always heard the question, you know, which one's your favorite, but I have never had anybody an adult anyways, ask an author, which book of yours do you like the least? And, and um, I, I, that, I just yeah. love that question now. <laughs> I love, and I was so proud of them. You know, they wrote their little questions down on a piece of paper, and I kind of previewed it, and you know, because we hadn't done this before. 
But, you know, I kind of got to a point where they just whispered it in my ear, and then they walked up to the screen, and they introduced themselves, and they asked their question, and, and I was just floored. I mean, they were asking some deep questions, and, and both authors were just, you know, so gracious <laughs> about, you know, and one lady, she's just like, man, um, wow, uh, I don't, you know, I'm not going to tell you which one I hate, but I have one that I truly, truly hate. <laughs> 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 so she kind of, kind of in a sneaky way was like, okay, read them all and see if you can figure out which one I really hate. But, um, you know, like I said before, when I was here visiting with you guys, um, the kids are always the star, and um, I was so proud of them. They just, you know, they just, I, they, I love it when they feel like they can ask a great question, and, and just, you know, they just felt like they were so cool that they got to talk to this lady that has a book on her shelf. <laughs> So that was such a cool experience. I was so proud of them and so excited we got to share that. Great. Um, so we we do have one question from staff, and I'll preface this with I, I was keeping track of, of all the sites and services that Cynthia was mentioning, so we'll be putting uh, links to all of that in the show notes. But you, you talked about Zite. Um, yeah. And is, is can you be a little more, can you provide a little more about, like, how do you get it? Is it an app? Is it a web service? What what Where, where do you go about yes. getting that? Yes. That is such a great question because I did kind of gloss over that part. Um, Zite is an app, and you can get it on your phone, on your tablet. It is free, and basically you just download that app, open it up. Um, you can use it without creating an account, but it doesn't necessarily track what you like and what you don't like. So, you know, I'm not always an advocate of, yep, download it and create an account. Um, but this one, definitely you want to create yourself an account, and it will give you the chance to choose some categories that you're interested in. And you can definitely tailor that to your personal and your professional taste. Um, because I look at education, I look at technology, but I also um, love photography. So I have articles that are coming to me um, about photography and tools and different um, resources that are out there. So you can make it, you know, very, very tailored to what you are interested in. And then, like I said, as you read your articles and you're giving them a thumbs up or a thumbs down just by tapping those two little icons, their wackadoodle algorithm will... <laughs> I love the word wackadoodle. Um, but they're... I don't know how it works. It just works. But um, they're algorithm will start to really tailor um, what you receive when you open up that app and you'll start getting things that are very very specific to what you want and then things that you're not interested in you will not see those probably again so it's um, it's free it's an app and it is um, just a super resource and I love that you can send articles through Twitter you connect it to your Twitter account and I'm not always a big advocate of connecting apps to apps to apps, but in this case, this is one that I definitely recommend. You do want to connect that to your Twitter account. And then you can tweet out an article to um, a group of people or just to anybody or to a friend, maybe that you don't have their email address. Um, you can also send it to, the e to your email. I've sent things to myself that I have been using for a blog post or for a presentation. Or you can also, it will connect um, automatically to your Evernote account if you are an Evernote user. Mm. Um, you can connect that to your Evernote account and then you can drop it into Evernote into a specific um, notebook or folder. And, um, but that is a great question. I'm so glad you asked that because um, it's a super, super awesome resource. Um, and somebody did ask in uh, the chat, the, the URL for this is zite.com, Z-I-T-E. Uh, at least that's where I found it, so uh, we're, we're pretty yep, sure. It is, and it, that just kind of gives you some information about Zite, but it is an app, so you have to go to either the App Store or Google Play or wherever you get your apps and search it there and download it from that. You, it's not a web-based resource. All right. And uh, 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 Mary Jo on our staff here had a follow-up that she wants to do by microphone. Hi, thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. I can. Hello. 
perfect. Hi, it's Mary Jo. Hey, um, I just was thinking, and I, I hadn't thought of this before, but if you're brand new to Twitter, this might be a good way to get started. You could load the app. You could see what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. You could, you know, get yourself uh, logged in and everything. Not mm -hmm. create any hashtags or anything right off the bat, but just start right. lurking and watching and seeing what's going on that interests you, uh, that's in absolutely. your interest area. Do you think that's a good way to get started? I hadn't thought of it absolutely. before. No, absolutely, because um, when you first sign up for Twitter, it's going to say you need to, you know, I think you need to find maybe, I don't know, six or 12 people to follow and, um, you know, definitely if you were stuck, there's some great people I could um, recommend to follow. In fact, I might throw those on a slide before I um, resend the link to Michael when, before he posts that and I'll put some people on there you can follow on Twitter. But the best way, you are absolutely right, to start using Twitter is just to create your account and just kind of follow some people and see what's going on and see what you're interested in. And there goes that lawnmower again. We're not hearing it. Thank you. I'm so glad because I can totally hear it. Um, but you can just get on there and absolutely see who's see what people are saying. It's what you make it. If you're following, you know, pop stars and and rock stars and you know celebrities, you're going to get all that, and and maybe that won't be as meaningful to you. But if you're following some educators, and trust me, there are some heavy hitters in education that use Twitter a lot, you will get some great resources. And you don't have to talk to anybody until you're ready. And then maybe just start by hitting that retweet button and just retweet something you think is cool. And then maybe get a little braver and decide one night on Wednesday night you maybe want to just kind of watch that Nebraska Ed Chat and see you know what people are saying about that. And then maybe next time you might introduce yourself on a chat. And if you do Nebraska Ed Chat, we always have a greeter and we have a greeter because we just feel like it takes a lot of courage to jump into a chat with a bunch of people you don't know. So we always have a greeter to welcome you to the chat and thank you for coming and if you have any questions you've got kind of some go-to people that you can ask those questions to because it's not second nature to everybody to be techie or to be Twitter oriented so you know but the more people we have in our network and the more people you create and make connections with the more rich of an experience it is so absolutely if you just download the app create your account, follow some people, see what they say, and trust me, you'll catch on quickly and it'll go from there and you will have some really great resources. So absolutely, I would do that. Great. Um, another question from the audience, Linda is asking, is there a charge for using Twitter like for text messaging? Um, just data. If you're using your phone, um, it would just be data. Not a lot of data usage if you're using it on a smartphone. Um, if you're using it on your tablet, it's just, you know, connected to Wi-Fi. So um, I am on Twitter quite a bit, and and I don't use a lot of data. We're, sh we're sharing data. This is new in our family. And trust me, I'm using the least amount of data, but I am, Chris and I are probably the heaviest Twitter users. <laughs> and we're not using hardly any. Yeah, and our two teenagers are using quite a bit. Yeah, there. I, I this is almost taking me back. I I used a little service to look up how long I've been on Twitter, and it turns out it, I I think I signed up for Twitter about the first week I got this job. It was about seven years and mm -hmm. four months ago. And originally, and I think you still can do Twitter purely via text message, via SMS, without using an app. And and if oh. you are paying for text messaging, that those charges would apply. But I got to be honest with 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 the advent of smartphones, I'm not sure really many people do that anymore. Um, I it, did not know that. Oh at all. yeah. No. Oh, see, that was before apps. Oh no. no. Yeah, yeah, didn't know. I remember signing up for Twitter. Probably. Oh my goodness. I bet I signed up for it and kind of forgot about it, which a lot of people do. And then um, probably about three years ago, um, Chris and I both kind of got involved in it and um, but I bet I have had my account 
probably for five or six years, but those first three years it just kind of sat there and I didn't do anything with it. And and now it's almost second nature. So, but no, I didn't know that you could do it through text messaging. But again, you're right. Through with smartphones, um, it really is probably the best way to kind of manage your account and and what you're looking at. So, right. So Linda, Linda again is asking, and and I'm I'm guessing Linda, you are new to Twitter, and that's good. You're you're in the right place. She says. So you do you need to download a Twitter app? Do you have to use an app? I would. I would. Okay. I would. Uh, but you can use it just as a website, too. You can go to Twitter.com. Yes, you can. Absolutely. And, you know, depending on how you end up using it, there there's the Twitter app, which I would definitely start with. But if you are first signing up, my recommendation, honestly, would be to go to your computer and sign up through the website. Because you're able to go into your settings and your, you can really set your privacy settings, you can decide um, can people just follow you or do they have to ask your permission? And when you're you know, first starting, it's, it's, the tendency is maybe to lock it down a little bit tighter just to kind of get comfortable. And sometimes the app makes it a little more difficult to adjust those things. So I, I usually recommend to people if you're going to first start out, Use your computer, go to twitter.com, create your account there because you can really see everything. You can upload maybe a profile picture a little easier and then download the app to whatever mobile device that you're using and sign in with the account that you created and then you can see everything. But um, that's, that's kind of the order that I would recommend that you do that. Um, starting with Twitter.com. Mm -hmm. There are apps out there that are Twitter management apps that you can use, and once you get a little further into it, you can um, experiment with some of those. Um, Hootsuite is an app that I have used. My husband uses Tweetbot, and if you use a computer, um, if you notice that um, slide I had that was showing the hashtags, um, on my computer, I use TweetDeck because it allows me to manage multiple categories and multiple hashtags at the same time. And that's probably more Twitter 201 than Twitter 101. <laughs> yes. But, um, <laughs> right. Start with Twitter.com, set yourself up, down, then download your app and log in, and that is a great place to start. Right. To which I'll just say, you know, if you if you don't have a smartphone, you don't have to get one to use Twitter. There there are way you can use, you know, the the right. website. You can do text messaging if you want to. Although I don't recommend it. Um, there there are many <laughs> ways uh, to do it. I mean, that used to that was originally the only way to do it was by text message. So there you go. Wow. Uh, okay. So here's a question or two that that I had, which which you you kind of mentioned policies. Um, and so maybe we can kind of go go down that uh, rabbit hole for, for a minute or two. Um, how do you handle following or, or friending students um, to that? You know, I, obviously you're very cognizant of what you're posting in the first place, uh, and you're obviously interacting, but if, you know, the, they need their own account to be able to follow you, do you follow them back, um, direct messaging, which is not public? Uh, how, how do you deal with those sorts of issues? That is such, you guys ask such great questions. Um, that is a great question. When I, my personal account, and this is, this is, um, this is me. This is my policy in terms of, of what I'm comfortable with. Not everyone um, is maybe as black and white about it as I am. But my personal account, um, which is the only account I use now, I do not allow my students to follow me. Um, if they do try to follow me, I, I do block them. And they know that when we first talk about social media and we talk about Twitter, I tell them, don't follow me, I will block you because I'm, that's a policy of my, that is my policy. That's something that, that I've decided for myself. Um, honestly, they will go and look at my Twitter feed because it is public and they'll say, you're not that interesting anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So wow. that kind of took care of itself, <laughs> but <laughs> but some um, some educators, you know, they do 
follow their students on social media and that's that's their choice. I do not. When I had a library account, um, I directed kids, if they thought they were going to follow me, I directed them to that account. And then that my account, I actually did not follow kids back. I could have, I could tweet back and forth to them and they could send me messages privately and I could send them messages privately, but I did not follow any students um, using that library account and that was just kind of a decision that I made. Some library accounts, some school accounts, you know, they follow, you know, each other and other schools and all kinds of stuff and that's really just um, a matter of, of what you're comfortable with and kind of, you know, where you want to go with it. If your school has a social media policy, then you really need to know what, what their parameters are for following um, students and how c accounts are used. Um, in my case, um, when I came to Fremont from Lakeview, they kind of already knew who I was and, and how deep I was into Twitter. And so they were very gracious about saying, yeah, we would, you know, you're fine to continue tweeting about the kids and stuff we're doing, but, you know, this is what we, we want you to do. So um, the first thing you really want to do is check to see is there a social media policy at your public library, um, in your board policy if you're in a school, check with your um, curriculum director, check if your tech people, and just kind of see um, what's in print and what you're kind of, you need to be mindful of, but that choice to not follow students was, was my personal choice, and like I said, they didn't find me interesting, so it kind of just took care of itself. <laughs> so, so Linda is asking, um, so, so people can see your tweets without following you? Yes, they can. If you set up your account in, in such a way, and that's why I recommend going to twitter.com, to do that because you can say, okay, you can't see me unless I give you permission to follow me. You can set yourself up that way or you can set your account that anybody can see anything that you say whether they follow you or not. And um, I think I might have had mine locked down a little tighter and then maybe as I went and got more comfortable I opened it up so that um, people maybe who didn't follow me but maybe followed a hashtag that I used could kind of see what I was saying and if they choose to follow me that's great and if they don't that's fine too um, and that's just kind of what you're comfortable with but yes if you set your account up to be public people can see what you tweet without having to follow you mm -hmm. just and and see if correct correct me if I'm wrong on this one with with something like Facebook you do have a certain level of granular control over this particular post um, can uh, only be seen by my friends or this particular post can is public mm -hmm. whereas Twitter it's pretty much your account is either public or not I think so it's been a while since I've looked at them but it's yeah. I do know that the Twitter policy and privacy settings are probably not as complicated as Facebook <laughs> right um, I get really confused <laughs> when I start looking at at Facebook um, and Twitter it's it's a little more a um, little more simple right. and you can the decisions you're making you're you're pretty sure what people are seeing and what they're not and if you're not sure um, log out and search yourself and see if you can find yourself then you'll know mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Yanni in our audience says, if you post something on Twitter, pretty much expect anyone can see it. Um, it, it Always make that assumption, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, that's, that's probably just good advice, period, uh, uh, on any social I agree. media. Absolutely. Um, and Linda asks uh, one more, uh, so is there a difference between following a hashtag and following a person? A, uh, yes. Following a person, um, <laughs> following a person, you are... Um, once you click that follow button under their profile, everything they say will show up in your feed when you open it up and, and kind of look to see what people are talking about. You will always see um, that person's tweets. If you follow a hashtag, um, you can go into the search and you can search a hashtag and it will pull up all of those tweets. Um, it's not something you can actually follow and have it always show up, which is kind of now getting us into the tweet deck 
mm -hmm. area where if you're on the computer you can set up a column that that will automatically collect all those hashtags so a hashtag is a little different than following a person but if you um, are on twitter.com and you search a hashtag you can save that search and then go back and you can always just easily pull that back up without having to retype it but there is a difference and once you get to the point where you're following certain hashtags you kind of end up having to move into maybe another management app to keep track of all that. All right. It does to at, at a certain point once you're comfortable with Twitter kind of as it is yeah getting into the tools um, yes. is really where, 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 where it really comes down to uh, I used uh, most of us around here do use TweetDeck also mm -hmm. and so you can set it up but then it, it and say, okay, so show me this conversation in this column, things like that. But yeah, yeah um, I think we have done in the past um, some uh, general how to use Twitter um, uh, uh, shows. Uh, you might want to, uh, anybody interested, uh, go back through our archive. At this point, they, it might be time to do another one. It's, they might be a little dated at this point, but um, <laughs> they, they, they are out there. Um, but yeah, get yourself signed up and, and acclimate yourself first before you really start getting into the tools. I'll, I'll completely agree with that. Um, and you can just follow, um, I know at least one staff member here, just kind of follows other state institutions, um, isn't interested in, in lots of conversation, just wants to know what, what's being announced by uh, other government agencies here. And, and it's a great, it can, for her, it's just a resource, and, and she finds stuff that way, and, and that works too. So um, kind of... It is really what you make it. Yep. It's, you can be as, as deep into it as you choose to be, and if you're, you're frustrated and you don't feel like you're getting a lot out of it. Um, it might be who you're following, or it just might be, you know, and I've met people that Twitter just doesn't do it for them, uh -huh. and that is absolutely fine. Um, but I went to the Google Summit in um, Iowa this summer, and I've been struggling with a way to convey to people how amazing, you know, Twitter is, for you know professional development and finding great resources and just inspiring yourself I mean every one of us knows what it's like to come home and feel like the life has just been sucked right out of you <laughs> and I can go to Twitter and I have you know people I follow that always seem to inspire me and kind of refill that well and Eric Scheininger was at Google Summit and he said in the middle of his presentation. You know, some people don't get Twitter, they don't understand it, they don't find it useful, but really, it is such a great resource. Why would you close the door on it? You just need to try it. And, and that really kind of hit home with me because it's free, it's 24-7. I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and can't get back to sleep. I'm on Twitter. <laughs> you know? I have friends that tweet me and go, really? You were up at 3 o'clock? Nice. Um, but that's, you know, that might be the only time that I'm still sitting still and long enough to actually read something. So it's whatever fits your life. It, it just, it just works. And why would you not open the door and let some of that stuff in? Yeah. And, and Bobby in our audience says, I'm that way with Facebook, Twitter, not so much. And yeah, everybody <laughs> needs to find, you know, that you, and, and to a certain extent, I would say too, it's, you know, the, the, if if the people you need to follow is your family and your family's all on on Facebook that and they're not on Twitter, then you know that's that's where you go and and so to to each exactly. their platform and you don't have to be on all of them and you use the ones that fit with your needs and your situation. So exactly, exactly. All right, so uh, we are uh, just over our hour here. Uh, I want to thank you once again. This was was wonderful. I think gives us a, a great kind of little case study is is how uh, uh, Twitter can be used in schools and got some folks' questions uh, answered there about how Twitter works on itself. So uh, thanks again. It was wonderful to have you on uh, the show again, and um, I'm glad we could catch you before school started because I know you get quite busy once that uh, happens. Yeah. Um, and we're getting a lot yeah. of thank yous for the audience. So uh, just for a moment here, I'm going to uh, take back control. And 
just say thanks to everyone for attending this week's session. And this is not the page I wanted to be on. So there we go. Give me one second here. <laughs> Um, and you can join us uh, next week where we have another uh, 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 school. We have uh, a, the uh, SVYA Lit Project, Using Adult Literature to Talk to Teens About Sexual Violence and Consent. Uh, we have a Romance Book Talks coming up, and uh, then on August 20th, What You Need to Know to Apply for a Youth Grant. So we've got a couple of different uh, topics coming up there. You can follow us here on the Encompass Live website, or we do have, uh, we are on Facebook. Uh, we do also post on Twitter. We just don't have a specific Encompass Live Twitter account, but the commission has that, or you can follow us on Facebook to get news about upcoming events and things like that. This show has been recorded, so thank you all for attending, and we'll see you next week on Encompass Live.